it started off as a play, how do you, uh, what was the process like turning it into a musical different than a play? Well, it was a one-man show yeah. first, yeah. then it was a feature film, and now it's a Broadway musical. Each one is very different. I mean, you just can't have a movie and then put ad songs to it, or you just can't have a one-man show and, and add music to it. It's, each one has to be very different, and that's what makes it unique. Um, when we did the one, when we did, when I did, I, I just go, when I did the one man show, I played all the parts, I played all 18 characters. When we did the movie, obviously I wrote the screenplay for that too, and we expanded that to the movie. The one, the musical, what makes the musical so different, in, in a musical, the real, uh, the, the dialogue, the real, the meat of the dialogue and scenes is done in the song. The, mu you, the dialogue is just to set up the song. So it's different. You can't have the scene, then say the same thing in the song. That's when it becomes boring. So uh, it's a whole different art form, and I really enjoy doing it. How wild has it been? You obviously started out with this story when you were a kid, seeing a guy kill a guy, and that gave you that yeah. image. But now you're a father. Now yes. you're almost like Joe in the movie. Like your father character. Yes. Uh, how crazy is it to see something change for you personally over every incarnation? Yeah, oh, that's a good question. When I first wrote uh, A Bronx Tale, I really related as the young boy to the father 30 years ago. Because my father was a bus driver, and he was the one who told me the saddest thing in life is wasted talent. And uh, But when I had a son... And when my son got old, I started relating to the father to the boy. So it was really interesting uh, when, I, when I play the character. I really just related more than to the father because I became a father. So um, a Bronx tale really is a, it's a cautionary tale, and it's about not wasting your talent. Uh, like I said, when I was nine years old, I saw this guy kill a man right in front of me. And... Uh, the cops came and they asked me, uh, they said they knew I was sitting right there. They said, who did it? And they, they pointed out to him and, you know, I said, I don't know. He didn't do it. I don't, I don't know. I just refused to rat. At nine years old, I was smart enough to know that. <laughs> you know, that was the thing in my neighborhood. You didn't rat, you know. The thing that makes Bronx Tale so unique is that Sonny didn't want me to be a, a gangster. Sonny wanted me to go to college and do exactly the same as my father said. But just my father was the one who said, I understand that, but just because who Sonny is, you will be influenced by that way of life. And he was right. And he said, you're in danger just by being around someone like that. And I was like, oh, dad, he's a great guy and they're all great. So I would sneak away and, and hang out as much as I could there. And my dad, who was a bus driver, uh, he was right, you know, uh, that uh, I was in danger a, a few times. And it ended up, obviously, when, when I don't want to give the ending away, but what happened with Sonny, you know, my father was right. Uh, yeah. Frank Leone, he was terrific. He's from here. He's from here. He's from Dallas, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, when, you know, it's hard to find these young kids who could be in the show because in, in the Broadway show because you have to get more than one because then you can't work them to death, you know, because of the laws. So you have to get two, three. So when they, cared, when they were talking to me about this kid they wanted me to see, Frankie Leone, I said, oh, where is he from? Brooklyn, Bronx? They said, no, Texas. And I was like, Texas? I said, really? I said, they said, no, no, you got to see him, Chaz. He's, he's good. I said, okay, l let me see him, you know. And then he came in and he auditioned and I was like, wow. You know, this kid is really good. You know, he had a swagger about him. He had a New York way about him. And he was terrific. And he ended up getting the part. And uh, I did the show with him on stage, you know, on Broadway. And he was just a terrific kid and a very talented young man. He said you were fun. <laughs> okay, well, that's a good thing. Good, yeah. He was fun, too. He's a good kid. What's your, uh, what's your 
your role when the show goes on on tour? How how much has the show been on tour? It just closed. It it, it, it just closed uh, in Schenectady, Rochester. Now it's in L.A. My role is what I'm doing right now. Okay, you don't have anything to do with the. <coughs> Re what? Revisiting the performances or... Well, I do, yes. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm still one of the producers. I wrote it, so I'm there, you right. know. So I go as much as I can, but... I mean, because it's my life story and it's about me, uh, I, I could sell it better than anybody, <laughs> you know. And, and that's what people want to see, you know. You know, they want to hear me talk about it because it's a, it's a story that uh, I'm very proud of. You know, it's a good question, you know. I mean, a Bronx Tale is a huge hit in Japan. Now, you say, what? How could that be? It's because, first of all, it's a great story. That's number one. Number two is the characters that I wrote are like archetypes. They're almost like symbols as opposed to characters. And everyone can relate to that. And that's why, and I hate to, and I say this very humbly, why it's a classic, because it's a tale that everyone can relate to. It's about, is it better to be loved or feared? Uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's the choices you make will shape your life forever. The saddest thing in life is wasted talent. It's, it's about Machiavelli. I mean, when I was a kid, Sonny the wise guy used to read Machiavelli. Who ever heard of that? Which I didn't know that the wise guys would read Machiavelli back then. And I would say, Sonny, when, when, did, you, uh, when did you read Machiavelli? You know, you didn't go to college. So he said, well, they sent me away to college a few times, you know. <laughs> Which I know what he meant when he said that. So when, when he was in jail, he would read Machiavelli. Which was very unique at the time. Was what was the process like on back, what was it, nine? When, when was the Bronx Tale, the one-man show? That was, uh, I wrote it in 88, 89. Okay, I was thinking like 90 or so. Yeah. Um, was that your first big hit? Yes. Uh, and yes. Uh, how, did you, how did you get people then to kind of like say, oh yeah, this guy telling his own story, a one-man show, he should write it and star in it? <laughs> well, I, I just, once I knew that, look, I ran out of money. And I had no money, and I was desperate. And I, 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 I used to box, and I worked as a doorman at a nightclub. I'm sure you heard the story. And I worked, as, and then I, this one guy tried to get in. I didn't let him in. To make a long story short, the guy was Swifty Lazar. He was the biggest agent in the world. And he said, you'll be fired in 15 minutes. And I said, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I didn't know it was him. The owner comes out, goes, Swifty. I go, oh, my God. That's Swifty Lazar? And they said, yes. I was fired in 15 minutes. You didn't have some big glasses. He had the big, I, didn't, I just didn't recognize him. He was nasty to me, you know. So I went home, I sat on the edge of my bed. There was the, uh, the card that my father gave me. The saddest thing in life is wasted talent. I had it on my refrigerator. I'm this young actor, I look at the card and I go, well, you know what? If they won't give me a part, I'll write one myself. So I went to Thrifty Drugstore, I got five tabs of yellow paper, and I said, what am I gonna write about? I said, I'll write about the killing that I saw when I was a kid, and my relationship with the wise guys and my father. And I started to write, and after 10 months, I had a 90-minute one-man show. I put it up, I borrowed money from a friend of mine, a legitimate friend, may I say, <laughs> and he lent me the money, I put it up, and bam, my life, was exploded. I won all these awards, best play, uh, everything. Uh, one man show, and all of a sudden, I got offered $250,000 a week after it opened. I had $200 in the bank. I said, great, I said, but I wanna play Sonny, and I wanna write the screenplay. And everybody, they said, no, you can't. We wanna get a star, and we want somebody else to write it. I said, well, then I'm not doing it. So they waited two more weeks to freeze me out, and they gave me, they offered me 500,000. Again, I said, I play Sonny, and I write the screenplay. Again, they said, not a chance, not gonna happen. I said, then forget it. Everybody in Hollywood thought I was crazy, because the last time something like this happened was Sylvester Stallone. Then it happened with me. 
almost 20 years later. So then I kept doing the show. The crowds kept getting bigger. The lines kept getting bigger. Uh, everyone came to see it. Nicholson, Pacino, they all wanted to play Sonny. Everyone, every director wanted to direct it. Every studio head wanted to make it. It was like, it was like an insane thing. So then they called me in one more time and they offered me $1 million. They said, he slid a piece of paper over. He said, you sign that check, you'll get a million dollars tomorrow. I said, okay. I said, but I play Sonny and I write the screenplay. <laughs> and he put his head down and he said, Chaz, this movie will never be made with you. You're a wonderful actor. He says, but no one knows you. We need a star in the part. I said, I know, but this will make me a star. <laughs> and he said, we can't do it. And I said, well, then I can't do it. He said, you're going to turn down this million dollars? I said, yes. And I stood up with my agents. And he said to me, I'll never forget his words. He said, uh, you realize this movie will never get made. And I said, you're right. It won't with you. <laughs> and he said, why are you so sure? And I said, because it's just too damn good. And somebody will, will believe in me sooner or later. So I went back, I kept doing the show at the theater. Crowds kept getting bigger, selling out every night. Then finally I did the show one night and I got off stage. And as soon as I got off, the stage manager walked over to me and said, hey, Robert De Niro's just saw the show. He's in your dressing room. He's waiting for you. I said, Robert De Niro? He said, yeah. So I walked downstairs, I walked to my dressing room and there was Bob De Niro sitting there. And I said, hey, how you doing? And he said, he says, he said, he said, that's the greatest one man show I ever saw. He goes, that's a movie. You did the whole movie on stage. He goes, this will make a great movie. I said, yeah, I know. I said, but no one wants me to be in it. They want to put a star on the roll, Bob. And he said, well, I'll tell you how I feel, Chaz. He said, you should play, Sonny. You'll be great. And you should write it because it's your life. He goes, I'll play your father. I'll direct it, and he goes, and if you shake my hands, we'll go partners, and that's the way it'll be. I shook his hand, and the rest is history. That's the way it was. Had you written anything before that? I've written, I was a lyricist for, I was in, because I sang, and I was a lyricist, and I wrote short stories, but that was my first play. So how did you know how to write a play? I was a great storyteller. <laughs> there you go. I was a storyteller. I used to tell stories on the corner, you know, so I was an artist. I, I, as a, I, I had the soul of an artist. I, I, I wanted. To, I was very good in school in English, and I would write short stories. And I just had. I, I, and I wasn't a great student. Even when I went to college, I wasn't. I was okay, but I. The, I had a knack of telling stories that I would see the story in my head. I don't know. It's one of those things. It worked out okay. The only thing that was difficult about it, when I first did it, after everyone came to see the one-man show, and then I did it on Broadway, I mean, when I did it in New York, the wise guys all came to see it. <laughs> and after, when I got off stage, they came in the dressing room and said they really loved it, but they said, you know, we love you, kid, but you gotta change the names. So I changed all the names to fict fictional names. Because it's a great story, and people love it. They love the one-man show, they love the movie. Why wouldn't they love the musical if I could get it right? Alan Menken, eight-time Academy Award winner. Glenn Slater, four-time Tony nominee. I, I got the best of the best people. Robert De Niro, Jerry Sachs, four-time Tony winner. Tommy Mottola, legendary producer. These are the people I brought around me. I said, I'll write the book. You guys take care of the music and lyrics. That's the secret in success. Hire the best people around you. That helps, you know. Your, it doesn't guarantee it, but it helps. Has your dad been able to see him? He was, uh, My dad never saw the musical. Even though he was a sax player, he might have loved it. The he would have loved the musical the best. He saw the one-man show. He saw the movie. He saw all my success. But he died, in, he died about 10 years ago. 
He died at 91. My mom died two years ago. She just missed seeing the musical. She was 97. But you know what? So they never saw the musical, but that's okay. They saw all my success, so uh, I'm very happy with that. I had them a long time, so I'm blessed. I always tell people I'm playing with house money. You know, <laughs> my life is I'm playing with house money, man. You know, where I came from and to be where I am now, this is it, you know. I'm good. How has Bob changed? Because that was his di directorial debut. The, fil like the film was his directorial debut. How is he different now compared to old school Bob when you were on set? Bob is, you know, Bob is Bob. Bob De Niro's, he's a great artist, great guy. He's the one who gave me my break. Um, I owe a lot to him, man. A lot to him. Uh, but he's a great man. I, I've, I've always loved Bob. Good guy. Good guy. So it's off the record, I guess, but being Sicilian, how was your lunch today? My lunch? <laughs> I got to tell you. Live. Yeah. And this is the truth. I've been to a lot of Italian restaurants because I travel ahead. This restaurant was fantastic. It was great. The food was great. The pizza was great. Everybody's going, you know, you got to try the pizza. I'm like, I'm a New York guy. I'm like, oh, here we go again. Now I got to try this pizza and make believe I like it. The, pe <laughs> the pizza was great. The lasagna was great. The chicken palm was great. Capizio's. It's a great place, man. When I come to Dallas, I come to Capizio's. <laughs> Am I saying it right? Campizzi's. Campizzi's. Is that it? I come to Campizzi's. Excuse me. It was really great. I really love the food here. It was terrific. I'm sure you guys like it, too. You come here a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's really... About five blocks. Well, it's solid, man. It's really legit. The key is the sauce. You got to have great sauce. Great sauce is very important. If you don't have good sauce, everything is bad because the sauce is the foundation. But Bronx Tale, I don't know if anybody has anyone seen the musical on Broadway? Oh, great. Because. Before you came back, Oh, before I came in? Yeah. It's really. Oh. It's the type of musical that the owner of the theater said he couldn't believe it that as soon as people left the theater, they would get online to buy tickets to see it again. So, you know, Alfred Hitchcock once said that there's only three things you could do to an audience. You can make them laugh, you can make them cry, or you can scare them. That's it. And he said, if you do two out of three, you got a hit. Well, in Bronx Tale, we make you laugh, we make you cry, and we scare you. So we do all three. So you'll see when, you, when, when people see it, how they legitimately cry, cry and laugh and stand up and cheer at the end. It's really a great, great, great musical. Great, and I say that humbly, if I can be humble for a second. It is, it really is. What was, what was the collaborative process like working with Alan Menken or with Glenn Slater considering you started out writing lyrics? Uh, I was going to write the lyrics for Bronx Tale. Uh, but then I met Glenn Slater and I saw uh, the other shows that he did. And then he wrote, I said, well, write lyrics for one of the songs. And he wrote lyrics for one of the songs. And I saw the lyrics and I, and I said, you know what? I love these lyrics. You know what? I'm just going to worry about writing the book. You take the lyrics. And he, and he just did a great job. Just a great job. What was, the, what was the collaborative process like, though? Did you, like, would you write the book and then he would say okay I'm gonna take out some of your dialogue and yes them in the lyrics. sometimes yes yeah. yes absolutely he would look at that and say I would say look I'm gonna write a big scene out of that that's what the, the sh should be and he would take that and then make it poetic and just take what it, and, and just beautiful man just you know talented guy three-time Tony nominee you know just <clears throat> you know just just really good really good you know You know, I mean, that's very, that's a good question. You know, when you hand your script over, when you're making a movie to a director, you hope they don't rewrite it, but Bob never let anybody touch the script, and he only wanted me to do it, and he was smart, you know? He knew that I knew, it was my life. He knew that I knew what really, what goes down, and he knew that I was a good writer, and he allowed me to go with it, you know? In fact, originally, the studio that want Sonny to die. They want the Sonny to live at the end. I said, Sonny has to die at the end. 
because that's a catharsis. Sonny dies, the boy learns from that. So we had, that was one little discussion we had. Like, it's not happening. So we did it our way and it worked out okay. Okay, last question. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, the opening is sold out in L.A. It's great. Yeah, it's just, I'm telling you, don't miss this show. It'll be a, a day, it'll be a night in the theater you will never, ever forget. You'll see it, and I guarantee it, you'll come back and see it again. You'll see. If I'm wrong, I'll buy you a pizza. <laughs> At Capizio's. <laughs> Campizis. <laughs> Why can't I say that? Campizis. We have a special... A member from Dallas wants to present you with something. Oh, great. Let me, should I stand up? Or? No, no, you can stay no. seated down. Oh. Dion Burnside, I just want to uh, thank you for coming to Texas. And uh, anytime someone of your stature comes through, we'd like to present you with something to take back to New York as long as you promise to wear it and let all the New Yorkers know that uh, this token's from uh, Dallas Police Department and one of the greatest SWAT teams in the United States. Oh, that's fantastic. This is a patch that we wear on uniform, and uh, if you wouldn't mind taking this. And, well, thank uh, you. And uh, just show that we, uh, we're thankful for you wow. stopping by. That's really, uh, that's really fantastic. Could I... Uh